Vivek Shaya says in her 2018 memoir, I'm Afraid of Men, why is my humanity only ever seen and cared about when I share the ways in which I am victimized and violated? This is a quotation that I have loved ever since I have seen it. Our lives are very, very different. We are both Canadian women, and other than that, our lives are very, very separate. But as I talk about this subject, it is something that I want to remind myself. Because of the insecurities of ableism and the ways in which people approach me, I often have an angle of just trying to list every possible symptom that I've ever encountered in order to try to make someone believe that I have what I say I have. And it just, it makes me feel like I'm just being like, someone please accept that I'm sick. And I don't really want to have that angle in this video because I shouldn't have to say every personal detail about my life and the ways that it is hard for people to believe me. I also don't want to assume that just because people have dismissed me and invalidated me and said very hurtful things in the past, that that is going to happen again. I want to try to put a foot forward of trust that people are going to not say terrible things because I haven't laid every way in which I have been hurt out. So back in May, I found out that it was more than possible that I have MS, multiple sclerosis. And this is really, really hard to hear because I've been dealing with chronic pain and disability for a long time now. And I've greened the parts of myself that I won't be able to fully embrace, the parts of myself that will be limited. Grieving that what I took for advantage as a child will not manifest as an adult, that I won't be able to do the same things that I thought I was going to do. I really valued myself as a caretaker, as a mental health professional, as a hard worker and a reliable person, someone who always showed up, someone who always went the extra mile, and realizing that I wasn't going to be able to fulfill that in the same way, that I wouldn't be limitless. I would have to limit myself in the ways that I was able to do life was really painful. I had to realize that my productivity and my schoolwork and my job performance would suffer, that I would need accommodation, that I would need extra sleep and extra time. And I've had to grieve a lot of things over the last few years as symptoms have become worse and worse and worse. And when I was once again sitting in a waiting room being told this isn't fibromyalgia, fibromyalgia does not manifest this way or decrease this way. And to be told that this is definitely neurological, it's probably MS, and that would make the most sense. And this is after years of being told that they won't give me MRIs because I wasn't sick enough. It was two years ago in March of 2021 where I was begging my doctor to give me an MRI, but she wouldn't because I wasn't bad enough to have MS. But she also wouldn't give me a fibromyalgia diagnosis because I had too many MS symptoms. And I hung up from that thing saying, will you give me anything? And she said no. That has been my reality for almost five years, being told that I'm too sick to do most things, but I'm not quite sick enough to be validated or accepted as someone who has a permanent disability. And so I spend a lot of time on temporary lists, being shuffled between things that are not helpful and that do not help me fully or completely recognize that this is a lifelong thing. So MS looks very differently depending on the person. About 15% of people have primary progressing MS, which is what people are most familiar with. It is a rapid decline, it happens normally in your 40s or 50s, and it is very debilitating very, very quickly. Then there's secondary progressing MS, which is much slower, and in all cases, roots from remitting relapsing MS. So remitting relapsing MS, as much as I understand, I am not a doctor, so forgive me if I mess up things, but the understanding is that you will have times both of relapses and you will have times where you do not have as many symptoms. But each time, your, your, your symptoms will not get worse during remitting, but they will often stay the same as what they were. And then in times of relapse, your symptoms will worsen or new symptoms will add and then that will get worse and worse until you will have time of remitting where your symptoms will level out. They will sometimes decrease, but often will stay the same. And each time you will normally have more and more debilitating pain and disability. Your lack of function will continue to decrease. And then in a lot of cases, 10 or 15 years after, you will get secondary progressing MS. This can be stopped. Not everyone who has remitting relapsing MS will get secondary progressing. But in the case of secondary progressing, you will often lose function of your ability to speak, your ability to walk, and you will often die earlier. So their current configuration of my health is that five to 10 years ago, I started having symptoms of MS. It was about 10 years ago that I started waking up and not being able to feel my legs, not being able to move. And I remember just telling people about this and being like, yeah, that's normal. Like, you know, often people's like legs fall asleep and they can't wake up. And I'm like, yeah, but I can't move my legs. And this was also the time in which my eyesight started rapidly declining. 
everyone else in my family has like you know those glasses that you don't need to wear glasses but you can wear glasses like if, if, if you're looking at a chalkboard 200 feet away you'll need glasses if you're wearing driving if you're driving you'll probably need glasses but not really you don't need them on your license but you know it could be helpful especially if it's dark and there's lots of glare like that's everyone else in my family and that was me until i was 16 and i went from like casually wearing glasses to not being able to see a foot in front of me i wear contacts in the videos where you do not see glasses on my face because i actually couldn't wear glasses because i had to go to the doctor every three months in order to get new contacts because my eyes were you know pretty much just deteriorating that fast that i would drop entire levels in three months which is very very scary it was around 16 17 that i also noticed that i was having much more dizziness much more headaches much more fatigue that was extreme you know i started to notice that i had a little bit slower condition and stuff like that which you know i've always been a very good memory and stuff but this started to slip in the tiniest way like it wasn't very obvious i've had lots of concussions which would probably be most doctors things on why i probably have this is because i had damage but i very gladly went into college and i got good grades and i did well and you know i continued to have fatigue and exhaustion and days in which i you know couldn't move my legs but i was like this is normal like you know i'm tired i've had concussions you know life goes on it was the late 2017 when i started to have like a lot of lot of trouble with my legs a lot of trouble with fatigue and then in 2018 i was hospitalized three different times i was collapsing i was having trouble just throughout my body that was just really really bad and i tried to go back to work and it just was not good i collapsed i would have like really bad allodynia which is when your whole body feels like it's on fire and it's incredibly sensitive to touch and yeah this time i also started noticing that my limbs would not respond sometimes and this was thought to be fibromyalgia and I was like, okay, and they were like, you will never recover. We did all these tests and there's no really big levels. Other than I had really, really low vitamin D was really the only thing that they noticed in my blood work, which is actually something that is common across a lot of people with MS. They're not really exactly sure the correspondence to it, but they believe because more people in Canada, United States, Russia, and more like Northern countries tend to have it, that it might be somewhat linked to a deficiency in vitamin D that begins MS because the highest degrees of people who have MS live in colder climates with lack of sun. In 2019, I was hoping to graduate, but I did not. It was incredibly challenging. I had put so much of my worth into who I was as a student, who I was as a worker, who I was as a friend. And having to step away from that was devastating. Like, the amount of grief of who I was and where I put my identity and realizing that was really, really difficult. You know, things got worse, things got better. You know, it was times when I couldn't move and times when I could. And, and I remember thinking in 2019 that I finally had a reason that people would take my pain validly. And I found more and more and more that people didn't. That it was almost like, you know, I was a drama queen or a hypochondriac because I was always in pain. Because it's the first time after quite a while of somewhat pain, I started, you know, expressing that, you know, I actually do have a lot of fatigue. I often do feel dizzy. I often feel like I have balance issues and hard time doing this. And, you know, I, I found that the more I talked about that, like when I used a wheelchair and a friend of mine said, but why would you come then? And I just remember sitting there dumbfounded being like, so you're saying I'm not disabled enough to use a wheelchair, but you're also saying that if I can't do something, I should just not come. And I remember like telling people that, you know, these are my symptoms and then being like, it's okay, you're young, you're pretty, you'll be fine. And I remember being like, but do you not understand what I'm saying? Like, this is not just a passing thing of like, you know, I'll have some back pain every once in a while. And in 2021, my body started to spasm. I started to have my body move without my consent is how I feel about it. I personally have never found anything scarier than my body moving without my consent. It's one thing for me when I'm having a flare and I'm trying to move my arm or I'm trying to move my legs and I can't because that just feels like, okay, there's a moment, I'll sit here, it will get better or, you know, I'll ask someone for help and we'll be fine. But when I'm sitting there and my body is moving without me choosing it to move, it feels like I'm not in control of my body. <laughs> And that feels incredibly scary. And as those symptoms become more intense, it becomes more like my body is now just not mine. It is a shell in which my brain lives and my body is just doing things on its own. That's, that's one of the scariest symptoms I have. There's other things that I won't discuss in detail, but it's just, you know, that, that panic of like, okay, like I was at a meeting the other day and I had to just like lay down because like, you know, my body was you know, gently contorting itself. Like, it's not, like, big things, 
but it's just like you know my my shoulders will like jump like this and stuff like that and it's just it feels unnerving and it's also very painful because as it happens like it will pull muscles in my like my patella um pulled one time which is my knee muscle just pulled because my body feels like it's running a marathon <laughs> you know, and then often I won't be able to feel and like I lose sensation really bad too. I have really bad balance. Like I often will like fall over or I run into things literally often. I like there has been days where I ran into this like same thing like four times just because I, I don't have good understanding of spatial awareness. I like my my perception and depth perception is just really off. I've, and I've noticed that I've, you know, lost words a lot, which is not common for me. I, I can't remember things I'm, you know, struggling or, you know, I, I'm struggling, uh, I struggle to remember things and I slur my words sometimes and, you know, it's those things that become, like, I've always valued how much I can remember things and how much, like, I was like, you know, it's okay if I, you know, have chronic pain because I can always use my mind. And that's probably one of the scariest things because if it is MS and the symptoms started five years ago, okay, they didn't give me treatment, which means MS can be stopped. There are many, many drugs that can slow the, the progression of MS and keep you from, you know, progressing further or getting progressive MS. The issue is that if I've gone five years without treating, I'm already at a level of disability that is very disabling. Like, I'm not able to do a lot of things based on what it is, and they probably can't stop that. My body cannot reverse itself into a more healthier thing that if they had caught five years ago or maybe 10, I'm not really sure exactly when it would have started because these things are slow and it's hard to be like, okay, maybe the eyesight was something else or maybe, you know, that legs things were something else. I'm not really sure, but it is really, really difficult to know that I spent so many years, you know, in pain, in not being validated and that people were dismissing me because to them, they didn't know, I guess, about remitting relapsing MS. Almost every doctor has seen it because I have very clear evident MS symptoms. Like everyone was aware of it, but to them, primary progressing MS is the only kind of MS. So if I'm not like 45 and rapidly losing every ability, then they're like, oh, well, you don't have MS. You just have like, you know, things. But instead, because it's over a five year period in which I am getting one symptom and it is getting really, really bad, and then it is taking a step back and I may have that symptom or I may just have a lot of fatigue, but that symptom isn't as active and stuff like that. And then another symptom comes and then, you know, like another one comes and it's more gradual and there'll be times in which I'm doing much better. Then like no one will acknowledge that it's MS. And there is a lot of grief there because the big thing for me as a person who's a writer, as a person who loves to create, it is very hard for me to realize that there could be a day if I do develop secondary progressing MS where I couldn't speak, I couldn't use my voice, and I couldn't use my hands. And I know that my value is not tied to those things. I am still valuable whether I can speak, whether I communicate, whether no matter what. I do not believe that people's value is based on productivity. And I am very thankful that I've learned that lesson over the last four years. That I've had the time to learn that if I couldn't walk, I was valuable, so I can learn that if I can't speak, I will be valuable. But it is very hard for me to acknowledge that I was dismissed for so long because I wasn't seen as a typical thing. Like, it makes me incredibly angry. I have spent so many years asking for basic tests, asking for basic healthcare, but it makes me very, very angry that I could end up with symptoms that could have been preventable but I was dismissed and invalidated because I'm a young woman and they would rather blame it on mental illness or on a disease that is understudied and underfunded and undersupported because it is primarily done by women. Even if my final diagnosis was fibromyalgia and, and all of my symptoms were fibromyalgia, I should have been treated with regard and respect, but that has never happened. I have always been dismissed by caseworkers, by medical staff, by family, by friends, by everyone because there is a lack of respect for people who have disabilities and also a lot of lack of respect for people who are not disabled from birth. And I understand that people who have disabilities that they were born with or that happened very early on life to receive terrible treatment. And I never want to invalidate that. But there's also an assumption because you were at one point able-bodied that most of the things you are doing are made up. Like the amount of fact that I sat there once and I'm like, yeah, like I can't walk 
and someone was like, but I saw on your test that you were depressed. Are you sure that you're just not really depressed? And I'm like, no, sir, I am not depressed. That is not what is going on. So it's 24 hours later and I just woke up from a nap. So I wanted to talk a little bit about fibromyalgia because I realized I kind of just talked about it implicitly and didn't actually discuss it very well. So the reason why I'm talking about depression and stuff like that is not only because women have traditionally been called hysterical or had a lot of their health being, you know, said to because of their emotions. The way that fibromyalgia comes in there is fibromyalgia is a diagnosis that is often given to someone where you don't have a pure intention of why this person is, but it's very evident that they have widespread pain throughout their body. They often believe that it is because of stress and that because of immense stress from an early age, your body just begins to having widespread pain that is at times unbearable. And this is that diagnosis of fibromyalgia. It works very well because my body does have pain in all four quadrants and it is in pain almost all of the time. So in the absence of any specific diagnosis, fibromyalgia would normally be the diagnosis that was given. I have chronic pain. So like I would still have chronic pain or any of those things, even if I have MS. So that's one of the things where like they didn't want to give me that diagnosis partly because they needed to rule out every single thing because it's a diagnosis of exclusion rather than diagnosis of this is something we see. So that also, and then also like the doctors were very aware of the fact that it's a very stigmatized disease because of the fact that it is almost entirely made up of women, mostly middle-aged women. And there's lots of stresses that happen to women in a patriarchal society that puts a lot of pressure, a lot of, you know, stress and levels of things on them that often levels with their bodies just being like, yeah, we can't do it. So it does make sense as a diagnosis for me. And even if that ends up being my diagnosis, I am perfectly okay with that. We do not need an entire history of cell research to know that like people's bodies deteriorate under a large amounts of stress for a larger period of time with lots of trauma. Like that is things that happen. So like that is, should just be an accepted thing. Even if it has been caused because of stress and because of emotional distress, someone's pain is just as valid as if it is caused from a cell deteriorating. Both of those are valid, but because of the ways that we think of emotions and because of the ways that we think of women, we often say that if it has been caused at all by stress or emotions or anything like that, or if the disease causes you know, depression, anxiety, or any of those things, then that means that it's not really a legitimate diagnosis, you know what I mean? And it's just so, so misogynistic. A lot of people will be like, I know someone who has fibromyalgia, they're perfectly fine. And then you'll talk to that person, they'll be like, yeah, life is sucky and people don't understand it. And people actively tell me that I need to do more even when I am, you know, breaking apart at the seams. So I am perfectly happy if my diagnosis ends up being fibromyalgia, but it is incredibly frustrating if it is not. And I spent five years in which people have told me, well, we don't really need to test you because you're a woman and, you know, you have fibromyalgia and fibromyalgia. We don't really need to give you that diagnosis because it's kind of fake and it's kind of not accepted. And we don't really want to do it until we've done all the other testing, but we don't quite believe you enough to do all the other testing. And it's just really, really, <laughs> irritating. So I will go into the rest of the video, but I feel like I need to clarify why I'm saying the things about fibromyalgia, why it is incredibly stigmatized. And I don't, I don't have a ground way. Like mostly I'm just talking to the people who I know love me and care about me. And I'm like, you know, I could have MS. I could not, I have not gone through the MRI because again, waiting. I, I love that Canada has universal healthcare, but it also means that things get lost in the shuffle. And my MRI test got lost in the shuffle. It's been seven months and I had to like recall them and be like, hey, and my doctor was like, I'm just going to reissue it because, you know, they should have called you because, because a lot of me doesn't want to make this test until I have an MRI with lesions on my body. We're saying that you definitely have something wrong with your spinal cord. You have a neurological issue. You are allowed to be angry. You are allowed to be validated in your pain. But the thing is, I don't need that. I don't need to have all of the medical tests to say that these are my symptoms. These are what has been happening to me for many years and to have the fear. Even if the tests come back clean, if they come back that I have a completely normal spinal cord, which, you know, probably won't happen. But my fear and my, you know, anxiety, you know, I have those things, uh, will be completely valid because it is scary. It's scary to have my symptoms, whether they're from a really well-known research disease or they're from a lesser known one. And they're valid if I'm worrying about really real outcomes. So I spent the last many, many months worrying about MS and I've spent the last, you know, 10 years worried about my health. And that's kind of where I am. I guess I didn't completely hold to my thing of not explaining, but I hope that I did in a way that is not like, I need to explain every symptom to be validated. And I, I don't know, I think I'm gonna grab my computer and share a poem before I go. Okay, so 
this is one of my favorite poems because it is one of my first ones. I kind of started writing poetry around the same time that I was first hospitalized, but this poem came from about eight months earlier. I believe that it was November of 2017 and me and my sisters were getting together because we were going to write some stuff and I wrote this poem because this is how I felt that day and then I changed it to a second person because I was so embarrassed at the idea that someone would see me this week. So the poem goes. The rain has already fallen upon your pillow, greeting your day like dew. Craters curved into your skin from lack of sleep, every muscle aching before the day has broken. Trapped inside a prison of your pain, rioting to be free, held fast by fatigue. Rising only to crumple once again, your body is quicksand, this is exhaustion. Yeah, that is written a long time ago, but I think it still sums up a lot of my feelings. I, I don't believe that illness or disability is a death sentence. I don't think that my life will be less valuable because I have a disability. I don't think that anything makes my life less valuable because people are not valuable on what they do or what they create or anything. They are valuable because they are people and they are unique and beautiful and loved. And that is what I firmly believe. So I don't want to ever perpetuate the idea that I must mourn being disabled because I'm a lesser person, but because I have to readjust who I am and how I take my identity, which I am thankful for because every time I believe that you know, I've accepted that I'm not valuable based on who I am. I realize another roadblock to be like, okay. And I do believe that those things allow me to love people more because they allow me to say, I know how little I do and how that doesn't change who I am. So I know that I can't judge other people based on what they do and what they cannot do. And I really, really hope in a world that better accommodates, that better believes, that better supports that journey alongside people who have disabilities because it can really, really suck. And it can feel really, really isolating to not know this. Like how many people raise your hand if you knew remitting relapsing MS, especially if you don't have anyone in your family or yourself who has it, like it's not well known. And yet I went through all of the steps of people telling me, you know, you have MS symptoms, but you can't have MS because you're not progressing rapidly. It's like, no, I read it and I was like, you know, periods where you will have high symptoms, periods where you have less symptoms or your symptoms will baseline and they are not worsening. Like, you just had to read like a Wikipedia page and know that I had it. Not that you should self-diagnose, but like, it's these things where it's like, no, like this is very evident that any doctor should have known, but because they have a specific idea of what an illness should look like, what disability should look like, and they exclude people like me from that, it becomes really, really damaging. Also, I didn't restate in this part, but I feel like I should, that 15% of people get primary progressing and 85% of people get remitting relapsing, which means that the like outstanding vast majority of people who have MS have remitting relapsing. And everyone continually was like, yeah, she has the symptoms of this disease, but it doesn't primarily progress, so she can't have it. I think that's always going to be my point is I don't really have like a message other than like listen to people, care for people and, you know, educate and advocate. And that especially goes to medical staff and people like that. And it does really, really frustrate me. And I am just aware of this constantly. And this is something always in the back of my mind. I think that that's also one of the reasons for people who watch my videos, for people who comment, who, you know, anything, like I am always going to be a little bit inconsistent. I'm also, you know, every time I film, like I'm going to have some kind of symptoms. You know, I'm not at a period in my life where I ever have symptoms. Like that's something that I guess is discussable. I know I said I was going to end, but every time I wake up and I don't feel immediately in pain, that like I move and my leg moves and I can feel it, is a day in which I go, oh, thank you, Jesus. I'm not making this up because I still have been told so many times that like, you know, I, I have back pain or, you know, I have this or I have that or, you know, you're young or, you know, I have someone who has fibromyalgia and they're fine. You know, they exercise great. I, was, I know someone who have MS and, you know, it doesn't really debilitate them very much. And I'm like, okay, but that's not the story I'm telling you, like, you know, or I'm so sorry, that must suck for you. And I'm like, okay, you know, some people can say that and you will still feel validated. I almost always feel like I have to make my illness into some kind of lesson to be like, yes, and people should love people, which I guess I kind of did earlier. But, you know, I, I do genuinely believe that. But I also feel like I always have to like either comfort the person or like, you know, sermonize it to make it palatable to be a person who's disabled because I can't just be like, yeah, no, I can't walk most days. I can't feel my body often. And, you know, my limbs just, and my limbs just, you know, go limp or, you know, move uncontrollably. It's great. And yeah, there's, there's just a level of constant pain where like, 
This is also something that happened back in the spring. I broke a rib in a car accident and I didn't realize I had a broken rib until like one day I realized my entire rib was swollen up and my roommate who's a pharmacist is like, uh, you know, that could be like life ending. <laughs> And I was like, okay, I guess I'll go into the doctor. And they were like, we're gonna put you on a lot of opiates because you're probably having trouble breathing. And I was like, yeah. And I was like, I was thinking it was weird that, you know, part of my rib it had this much pain because I'm used to that much pain, but like my rib is kind of like one of my free zones where there's not normally like a ton of pain in my like front rib. And the fact that they were like, yeah, no, you're probably like, you know, not breathing properly and that could have a collapsed lung and your rib is broken and all of this. And I was like, yeah, okay. I've been living life for Three weeks perfectly you know whatever yeah I just did it again an example of like you know I need to say this terrible thing happened so you believe me but like it is very true it's like I didn't notice my rib was broken because my threshold of pain was like this is a normal threshold now that's my story of being like not noticing things are wrong with me I'm just so used to pain but like that pain is boring. Like I've said that before, like I don't want to feel whiny a lot of the time. It's like, yeah, all of my body is numb or in pain or like something is going or I can't feel that or I'm like, you know, trying to make sure that my leg doesn't spasm uncontrollably so that someone notices beside me because sometimes it just goes and I'm like, okay, this is really embarrassing. Everyone else is quiet or everyone's talking or, you know, like things like that. Like there's just a constant um, whirl of like, how do I make my symptoms less noticeable? And that's just, you know, part of life. And I don't know how to talk about those things because I do think that representation matters and to be like, this is what it feels like to live with this. But I also want to be true to Shreya and never have to like say my pain every single time for someone just to believe me. So those are my thoughts. Uh, if you have MS or something like that, I'd love to chat. If you don't have MS, please don't say, uh, I hope you get better because I won't. I'm really sorry about that. And hopefully I get an MRI soon and I'll talk to you next time. Bye.